Good morning, Rod and Jens. I'd like to compliment you, and the culture that you have set up here is clearly one of education. Um, it's humbling to be part of such a great faculty. Uh, speaking as a pediatric spine surgeon, I'd say a lot of the learning I've done over the years has been from my adult colleagues, both in neurosurgery and in orthopedics. Here are my disclosures. Anyone want to give me money? I'll put your name up. <laughs> and uh, so one of the big things that are different when you're dealing with kids is parents. This is one of the favorite studies that we're doing right now. I used to think that parents that seem just too uptight at first may actually be hurting the kids. And it's too early to tell because we don't have hundreds of numbers yet, but it looks like when we give parents anxiety tests preoperatively, those who are the most kind of anxious and off the scale in terms of one standard deviation, their kids are three times more likely to be taking narcotics at the post-op day 14 visit. So we really sit down and talk to the parents and say, okay, you know, you got to trust the system a little bit and try to scale down in front of your kids so your kids aren't too anxious. And when we looked at what's really important to the kids and the parents, their number one concern is pain. When we look at what's most important to the surgeons, they're talking about things like shoulder balance and LIV selection. So this has changed how we approach families. They care about pain more than anything else. So now let's talk about uh, mechanics here. This is a typical lanky one curve, no surprises. This is the most common thing we're doing. It tends to be hypokyphotic, and if it's not hypokyphotic, we should be getting an MRI preoperatively. That's a good test question. And we've shown that 10% of the time in AIS, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, there's an incorrect number of thoracic or lumbar vertebrae. So part of the preoperative planning is count the ribs, count the lumbar spine, and mark 12, because it's an unwinnable lawsuit if you're in the wrong place. And preoperatively, we expect there to be some asymmetry in all planes, as uh, Dr. Dubasay points out. Always look at that, um, ooh, I like that, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Always look at the rib hump, it's three dimensions. And what about the lowest instrumented vertebrae? Uh, the team from St. Louis has shown us that probably the best predictor we have now of a successful lower instrumented vertebrae is the lowest substantially touched vertebrae. That's the one where the center sacral line touches the pedicle. There's lots and lots of things out there. Let's be simple, that's all you need to know. Now, the sagittal plane, I think, has not been paid enough attention. And we've shown in a multi-center study that if you go too high, you're more likely to have DJK. So just like when you're choosing the lower instrumented vertebrae for Sherman's kyphosis, you want to draw the posterior sacral vertebral line, and you want to pick a lower instrumented vertebrae with the center of the vertebrae anterior to that line. If you're not anterior to that line, our series found 17% distal junctional kyphosis. And one of the big changes taking place in pediatric spine surgery, as Dr. Johnson was talking about, is think of your team in the OR. I personally send out an email, it's now to 34 of my team members in the OR, everybody in the OR, including anesthesia and my nurses on the floor, what we're gonna do with every patient, ex precisely what instrumentation is needed, and what that does is it gets the team on board, they feel respected, they're behind you, they want you to succeed, and at least half the time, I get a private email back going, hey, you may want to think about it this way, and patient care is helped. It's better to have 34 minds than my small mind. Okay, so when we're setting up, remember, it's hypokyphotic. Scoliosis tends to be hypokyphotic, so we want to have some pads, not only under the pelvis, but also under the center of the ribs to help lift up into kyphosis. And when I was a resident, you wanted low blood pressure all the time to minimize blood loss. Well, that's true now. We do want low blood pressure, maybe MAPS in the 60s while we're doing a dissection. But once we're correcting the spine, we want the MAPS up into 70s or 80s because that's when the spinal cord is at risk. And you see this monitor? I have this monitor right in the OR so everyone in the OR could see the maps. What used to happen is I'd ask anesthesia, okay, we're about to crack, you guys at 75? Yeah, yeah, I'm at 75. I look over, they were at 60. Like, well, we're trying to get to 75. So once it became very visible to everybody, anesthesia's on top of it. They're being watched. And we did a multi-center study where we found out 
that simply by raising the blood pressure was enough to return lost neuromonitoring signals in 20% of the cases. Um, so the first step always when you lose signals is raise the blood pressure. We found out raising it from 70 to 84 seemed to do the trick. We have two dissecting teams, my PA and fellow at the top, myself and the uh, scrub tech at the bottom goes a lot quicker. And we did some research where we found out that we already have dedicated anesthesiologists to the spine team and surgeons obviously, but when we start a case we have a scrub and we have two circulators. And then with lunch breaks and time shifts and all different things, a lot of people come in. And it turns out that if at least 60%, or if we have less than 60% dedicated spine team members, then we had longer OR time, more blood loss, and more blood transfusions. So we had a operating room nurse manager part of the study. Now she believes in spine teams and she wants to have dedicated spine team members because they truly are better outcomes. Okay, so the number one pearl to loosen up the spine is do good carpentry. Do osteotomies, take out the facet joints, take out the ligament and flavum, interspinous ligament. Number and here's an example of a bone scalpel. You know, in the old days, I used to bang with a hammer, and it is kind of fun, it's good carpentry. I think that a bone scalpel has less force and is more precise, and it stops bleeding. You don't need to go in and use a bone wax. Don't touch the dura with it. You can cut dura, uh, but generally, this is a very safe way to cut bone. Now, the number two pearl to maximize correction is a stiff rod. As we see, stainless uh, cobalt chrome is stronger than steel, however, size trumps the, ty the type of metal. So we really wanna have a six millimeter rod if we're doing scoliosis correction over long distances. This is very different than small adult cases. So the pedicle screw pattern. I tend to put a concave correcting rod in the left. This is the example of a simple lanky one curve. We wanna screw at every single level so we share the load and we don't pull out screws. Now on the right side, we're not doing the correction. We want a minimum of two anchors at the top so it doesn't pull out, two anchors at the bottom so it doesn't pull out, and then two anchors where we're going to derotate. Let's talk about derotation. There's two methods. There's differential rod bend and there's direct vertebral rotation. Why not use both? So it started off having one screwdriver on one screw. That caused derotation, but as you can imagine, it also plunged some screws. So the newer way to do it is you wanna to hook together in a triangle two, or if you can, four screws. And we have four screws linked together, it's 10 times stronger than a single screw. So I'd encourage anyone who's doing derotation, put a screw into a cadaver, try to rip it out. It's pretty easy. And kids have been paralyzed and people have been killed from screws being ripped out. Put four of them together and it's all of a sudden really hard to plunge a screw. Using this technique, I've never had a bad screw plunge. And there's different ways of derotating, different ways of hooking together the vertebrae. This is my preference. Um, little things that I took part in designing here. You make a triangle, you have the two screws in there, and in the middle of the thoracic spine, we always use four screws on two vertebrae to minimize the opportunity for plunging. Um, this, for example, is at, let's say, L1. This might be at T7 and T8, and we need a lot of vertebrae open between there so you can rotate between the open vertebrae. And why do we use counter torque? If you just twist with one hand, you're not getting much twisting. If you twist in two different places, you can really get a lot of twisting. And here's what it looks like intraoperatively. You should be able to get about 45 degrees of twisting. And at the end, I may take that one down at T12 or L1 and pick it up to T4 or T2 to even derotate the top as well. And after derotating the vertebrae, rotate the rod 90 degrees. So we turn what is scoliosis into physiological kyphosis. Expect the rod to flatten a little bit, it will. Then do distraction because distraction will improve the scoliosis and the concavity and it will improve kyphosis. We wanna maximize space available for the lungs. Then the final thing is the L bending and the key point here is you want your hands low so when we're L bending, we're again trying to maintain kyphosis. 
If you bend lordosis into it, you know, you've ruined what you're trying to fix. You want to improve kyphosis. Do not push down in the rib hump. I've heard people say that in lectures. You don't want to create lordosis. We want kyphosis in the thoracic spine. Now, the other technique is differential rod bend. So this is two real rods from a simple scoliosis case. You always want more uh, kyphosis in the first rod of the concave rod because you know it's going to flatten, and the second rod is flatter. So here's an example of the second rod going in. We're pushing at the apex around T7 or T9, pushing down to do that final derotation. And at the end of the case, the screws should be pointing more or less forwards. Oftentimes, the apex is still off to the side a bit. Don't beat yourself up over that. And what we found out is when we switch to using irrigation with soap solution and vancomycin, our infection rate fell by a factor of 10. That's huge. And most people today are putting vancomycin powder in, seems to also drastically decrease the infection rate. And this is what we'd expect post-op, and I am intentionally showing one who's a little bit off there. Expect for three months, you know, the uninstrumented spine will straighten itself out, tell the parents not to freak out at first. And if we do this correctly, remember those two rods were bent very differently? They end up about the same, and we reproduce physiological kyphosis. So we expect it to be improved in the coronal plane, but what the girls care about most is the untwisting. And not their back, they care about their front. And when I first started really doing derotation effectively, the girls convinced me how effective it was because I had a few of them in the recovery room, literally tears coming down their eyes going, you didn't tell me to fix this. I'm like, I didn't know you had that. You know, American surgeons are never looking there, but that's what they care about. Okay, so let's talk about big curves. How do we treat big curves safely? Let's think about time and distance. So one way to do it over time is traction. Don't do this too much anymore, but sometimes we could do intraoperative traction, or my preference for most cases is temporary distraction rods. We're gonna be doing this in the lab step by step, but the idea is you wanna slowly stretch out the spine over time to give all the soft tissues a chance to relax and allow the blood supply to re-equilibrate to the cord. Might be an hour, might be a week. I love this study by Nockamson. We can't do this anymore. He actually put a load cell on a Harrington rod, and over the course of a week, watched the stress decrease. You decrease the stress one third in the first hour, the next third in a week, and that's, I, sh I shouldn't say it's why I go back seven days later. I do that because that's when I have OR time, but sometimes when you stage it, we go back the next week. And this is never safe unless you have good monitoring. A former SRS president called me up and goes, I use your technique, the spine straight, but the kid's paralyzed. I'm like, well, when did you lose signals? Well, I didn't have them to begin with. You don't have signals, you don't use this technique. So here's a typical kid, 12 years old, 112 degree curve. Um, we're gonna go over this in the lab, screws at the bottom, hooks in the ribs at the top. The essential thing is that the rod is off to the side so you can work on the spine and you want to have at least 15 centimeters of overlap because it's always surprising how much longer you can get that spine. If you don't have 15 centimeters of overlap, the two rods are going to uh, just go past each other. And what's interesting is as you distract the spine, the apex derotates. So when you have those 100 degree curves, you feel like you're trying to you know, shoot a pedicle screw up, but as you stretch out the spine, it derotates, then it's so easy, even I could put the pedicle screws in the apex. And this is what we kind of expect for a 112 degree curve. You know, it's never going to derotate perfectly, but we are going to be able to make it a lot better. The kids are thrilled with the results of this, even if the x-rays don't look good. And this is without cutting ribs. Um, I like the idea of not necessarily stopping surgery, but staging it if it's the wise thing to do. <clears throat> Coming back a week later is not a sign of weakness. It's often a sign of wisdom. So here's a girl with a 133 degree curve. So I'm showing an old case. This is kyphoscoliosis. <laughs> I can't talk very well. When you have kyphosis and scoliosis, there's a much higher increase of losing signals. So she's a setup to lose signals. I'm showing a really old case when I actually put a wire in there to show that the power of this is a distraction and not the pedicle screws. And as we were doing this, we lost neuromonitoring. And over a third of the time, we do lose neuromonitoring. And when you lose neuromonitoring with this technique, 
You simply go in and you loosen up the rod to rod connector. It generally shortens by two centimeters and every single time I've ever done that, the MEPs come back instantly. But that says you're done for the day. Don't keep pulling on it or you may be losing signals for a lot longer. That means come back in a week. And if you're coming back in a week, think of getting the kid nutrition in between. Um, you wanna maximize nutrition. And this is what the child looked like. Again, this is probably a 15 year old case, not all pedicle screws. And even though the x-ray doesn't look perfect, she's 12 and a half centimeters taller. When I was a resident, I was told you couldn't do this. It was too dangerous. Someone would be paralyzed. So I'm proposing to you that this is a safe, staged fashion for massive curves rather than do VCRs, because VCRs aren't reversible. You can't put bone back. When you're stretching things out, you can always stop stretching, stop for a day, come back later. No anterior approach, no holes in the head. And this kid, we did have to cut out ribs. So don't do this without good monitoring and without high blood pressure. But if you have good monitoring and good blood pressure, this is a very safe technique. So correction over distance, in my opinion, a VCR is not needed for, anter for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. I've never seen an idiopathic scoliosis case that I thought needed a VCR. If we can get 10 to 15 degrees per posterior osteotomy and you're doing 10 levels, that's enough correction. I have seen and heard of children who had VCRs for idiopathic scoliosis who were paralyzed. And if you have a case where there's a very high DAR, where there's a lot of angulation, very sharp, we know from some studies that you have a very high risk of loss of motor potentials. This kid, for instance, has a DAR of 32.5, so it's 65 degrees over two levels. If a VCR was performed here, as the first three surgeons recommended for him, by this chart, there's over 90% chance of MEP loss. And even if you can get it back, you often, have, you often can get the MEPs back at the expense of correction. So what we did here is we still ended at L2, as we should have anyways, went up a little bit higher, because you never want to end at T6, that's the apex of kyphosis, and did a lot of, or four pontiosteotomies, got the kid plenty straight with minimal risk of losing MEPs. So post-op restrictions. I honestly don't give any post-op restrictions to my kids. I say you can go out and play football or parachute tomorrow if you want to, um, but I generally recommend maybe three months of waiting if you're gonna play football. Otherwise, I have kids dance, play soccer, swim, water polo, really as soon as they're able to. It's frequently two months or three months when they feel like doing it. And I think it works. My rate of screw breakage is less than one in a thousand. I've had two rods break in about 15 years. Oh, time's up. I guess that's it then, thank you. <laughs>